Then the next thing going on is the multiband compressor. So if you are a noob to multiband compression, I probably know what you're thinking. This stuff is way too intimidating. I noticed the first time I ever opened up a multiband compressor, I had no idea what that thing was. Because at the time, I didn't even really know what a compressor itself does. And now here was a thing that was compressing for four different frequency bands. And I had no clue what to do with it. But to all the newbies, don't worry. It may take a bit of time to get into this, but it's really not that hard actually. Especially for the mastering stage. Because in the mastering stage, uh, the multiband compressor just adds a little bit of punch and gives more control to the peaks in your mix that are mainly coming from your kick drum and your snare drum. So we don't need a whole lot of compression in there really. We don't want, to, we don't want the mix to really punch your ears. We just want it to soothe the thing out a bit. So let's talk about the first band. That's going from 20 hertz. This is set, I cannot move this barrier. And this is going up to 130 hertz. So in this band, there's mostly the very low end of the bass guitar and also the low punch of the kick drum. So now we need to handle the compression very delicately to make the impact of the kick still stick out nicely. But also the bass guitar still needs to keep its volume. The way I usually set this is I put a ratio of about 2 to 1. And then I set the threshold that it's compressing about minus 2 dB. Let's just single this band now. And look at this. See, if you try to make an average with your eyes, it's pretty much compressing about minus 2 dB. Not too much, you know? And now very important also are the attack and the release time of the compressor. As you can see, I also don't use anything else, not the limiter, not the expander or anything, just compression to keep it simple and not overload my brain. So now remember how we set the compression for the kick drum. We use a very slow attack to make the kick really hit out and the very fast release uh, that it's not too chopped off. So we can use almost the same approach for this compression in here now. So we have a very slow attack of 50 milliseconds that leaves the kick drum time to really have its impact and punch you in the face. So what's happening now? As the kick hits, the whole low band is being compressed down in volume, but just right after the kick has hit, you know, after the 50 milliseconds. So this means also the volume of the bass guitar is lowered. And now with the release section in here, you can sort of determine how fast the bass guitar is coming out again or how slow it's coming out again. So if you would set it very fast, then you would have a very constant bass guitar in there. If you would set it very slow to the other extreme, then the bass guitar would be also compressed way longer after the kick has hit and this sort of lowers the overall volume of the bass. So with this, you can pretty much control which of the instruments are coming out better. Also with the attack time, if you set the attack time very fast, for example, to, uh, not too fast, to one millisecond, then you pretty much destroy the impact of the kick. So let me just demonstrate this to you. Let's make a very fast attack and a slow release and see what happens. You may need to turn up your speakers for this, but uh, you hear this is a very constant low section going on. So if we give the kick drum enough time to hit now and put the release very fast, then you see a noticeable difference. So you notice the low section of the kick is still having its impact and really cutting through. Um, now to make this even more noticeable, you can set the release a bit slower 
to about 150 milliseconds because then the bass guitar still stays a bit lowered in its volume. It still gives the human ear enough time to really recognize the impact of the kick drum, you could say. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but this again helps to have nice impact from the kick drum, but still the bass guitar also has its fullness. So let's go to the low mid. I set it from 130 hertz to one kilohertz. And now just listen to this one. So you notice the low mids of the guitars are lying in there and also the low punch of the snare and also still a bit of the bass guitar. Here's pretty much the same approach as with the first band. You still want the impact of the snare to come through, but still I approach the compression ratio and the threshold the same as with the first band, a ratio of about two to one and then set the threshold that it's constantly around minus two dB. Then let's go again to the attack time and release time. Again, remember for the hit of the drum kit to come through, you need a slower attack time. So here I set it to about 40 milliseconds. But now in this band, I set the release quite fast because if you put it very slow, then just think of what's happening. The snare is hitting and then the lower midsection of the guitars is being lowered in volume as well. But we want the guitars to be quite constant in the whole mix, so we need a fast release time that the guitars stay up. And this is pretty much the exact same approach for the high mid section, which is going to 6.8 kilohertz. Again, here I set the ratio not too hard to keep it a tiny bit more dynamic and also to let solos come through better and not being compressed too much as well. And again, threshold set that it's compressing about minus two dB. And then here the attack time and release time are the same as with the second band. Now let's come to the fourth band. Let's just listen to this one singled. So you'll notice this is very bright. It has a whole air section of the frequency range in it. So what I first like to do is boost the gain of this one to have a nice bright sound in the whole mix. And then again, the ratio is not set too hard in here. And threshold again, that it's compressing about minus two dB. So let's go to the times in here. Again, this is the exact same setting as with the other two bands in here. Here I like to have a slow attack time as well to let the crispness and the brightness of the snare come through also very nicely. And then again, the release needs to be quite fast so that the cymbals also stay on a more constant level. And that's already it for the compression side. Another approach that you can try out for multiband compression, which I also want to use in my future projects, so first it would normally compress even a bit harder around minus 5 dB to get even a bit more control on the peaks. But instead of compressing 5 dB at one time with one compressor, uh, rather use five different multiband compressors with the same setting but each one only compressing 1 dB. This helps to leave your mix more transparent and it doesn't compress or squash your mix to death. And then let's go to the loudness maximizer, the thing that comes at the very end. That's the thing that makes your whole mix very loud, but still prevents it from clipping. So if I turn this on, now this slide in here uh, determines sort of the maximum volume that is reached. I like to put it to minus 0.1 dB. This is already a very 100% safe setting. There's no clipping going on at any time. If I set it to 0 dB, there still might be a chance of it clipping, but so minus 0.1 is very safe. And then with this threshold bar in here, you can determine how loud it's going to be. So this is our ceiling, and with this one we can punch more volume into the whole thing. I th think the best way to sh explain this is by a simple demonstration.
Notice it's going very loud, but it's never clipping. Now, the way I like to set this is if I single the rhythm guitars, I like them to reach a level around minus three dB to still leave enough headroom for the drum kit. So, and minus seven is already a good spot. I can unsolo this and Bam! Then I also like to add a tiny bit of reverb. As we look in the graph section, you see it's at the very front, actually. Um, the reverb really helps to still stick all the instruments and the whole mix together some more. It's serving as a glue, you could say. So if I just solo the reverb signal, you see I don't use it too much. This again is just helping to glue the whole thing together. And this is already it if I look at the frequency spectrum again. You see we have a very nice slope in the mix and very nice punch to the whole thing. And it sounds very in your face and it's all ready to be rendered now. So for rendering, you just choose the area that you want to render in the song. Go to data, export, audio mix down. Choose a folder and the name. It's just New Groove because I was making a new cover of the song New Groove by Periphery with some free amp simulation and stuff. Choose a audio format, then you export it. This may take a few minutes. And then you need to listen to the song again and again, day in, day out on your computer, on your music player, in your car uh, to really notice whether your song is also transportable to many different audio situations. And then you might want to adjust some minor things here and there accordingly and then export it again. And that's finally it for mastering.